Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. Welcome back to Augustus Along Part 3, our month-long read-through of uh, The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Suetonius. I have the Robert Graves translation revised by Michael Grant, and I hope you found this week interesting. Uh, I, I hesitate to use the word enjoyable because this is, this is a hard week to enjoy. Um, it does not edify our, our mind or our hearts. Uh, we start with Nero, whose very name conjures up connotations of tyranny, madness, crime, evil. And then we move on to the year of four emperors when there is revolt after revolt after revolt. And uh, we have Galba, Otho, Vitellius in quick succession. I'm actually wearing my cheetah shirt because we'll sort of do like a lightning round with those three. Uh, but let's begin with Nero. So Nero is the last of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. He is stepson to Claudius. Uh, he is, his mother, Agrippina, or Agrippina the Younger, or Agrippinilla, is the final wife of Claudius. She's also a sister to Caligula and Nero's mother. So she got to hang out with a lot of interesting uh, uh, human beings. Um, she essentially ensures the accession of, of Nero as a teenager to the, uh, to the throne by murdering Claudius and then sort of pushing Nero forward as his heir rather than uh, the biological son of Claudius Britannicus, whom Nero later murders. So Agrippina is a really fascinating individual. Um, she, again, sort of uh, there around the throne across three emperors, uh, the final three emperors of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, and she ensures the, the, you know, the accession of her son Nero, who repays her by murdering her. And um, it, it's it's really hard to describe, like there aren't really adjectives to dis that properly describe Nero and his behavior. Um, evil, detestable, inhumane, like th there aren't really adjectives when you get to someone who, who truly uh, perpetrates that much evil upon uh, individuals and you know just systematically so he, he murders Agrippina who again I wish we knew more about her like even though she you know murdered Claudius to ensure that Nero uh, becomes emperor and that's not good she is fascinating and interesting when Nero goes to murder her, he has different plots he builds this collapsible boat conjures up a rationale to like get her on this boat when it collapses she manages to swim back to safety which is an incredible feat and then Nero murders her um <clears throat> and it, there's a question I think that we have around how reliable is Suetonius particularly about Nero and I think that's a valid argument when we get to Otho and Vitellius I'll, I'll try to remember to mention that at the end there's a personal connection involving Suetonius's father uh, serving under Otho that makes us question some of the presentations of Otho and Vitellius. But, um, but with Nero, I guess the question is like, who would make some of this stuff up? Like the business about dressing as a wild animal and then like attacking people. That's just so strange. It, it, it is so strange that it feels almost factual. Um, and there, there doesn't, I don't know that Suetonius is writing to please anyone by bashing Nero. He's, he certainly is fascinated by strange uh, strange stories, anecdotes, and gossip, but it, it just feels factual. Um, so Nero, Nero's awful. I'm not going to pretend. There's an, I had the misfortune to be reading the chapter on Nero the same day I was reading, uh, working on Jason Compson's section of The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. And I had to just put them both aside and go read something else because th th those were two guys I didn't want to spend any time with. Um, so... We have Nero, we have five pages on his like his family heritage, we have five pages on the early aspects of his reign as emperor, and then we get 25 pages of what Suetonius calls his follies and crimes. And the first one that's mentioned is his, <laughs> his love for music. I want to go on record saying, appreciating music or playing music is neither a folly nor a crime. Forcing people to watch you perform is not ideal behavior, right? That's pretty bad. Uh, but Nero, <laughs> Nero was just... That's a focus point for him. He wants to race chariots and play music and act in plays to the point that he goes to Greece and participates in festivals and games. And then when he returns, essentially celebrates a triumph. <laughs> With the, like, these are the plays he acted in. These are the, you know, this is him playing his lyre. <sighs> and, and how strange that must have been for Rome. Even after Caligula, how strange that must have been in Rome. Uh, we... We also have this weird juxtaposition, which is that we as modern readers look at Nero, we have all these negative associations with him. He truly is, I think, 
widely regarded as one of the most evil individuals to have ever sort of like ruled in history. Yet, he is bizarrely popular with the Roman people. Even after he uh, dies by suicide when the Senate has condemned him and is basically looking to publicly execute him and there are rebellions, you know, in flaring up around the empire. Even when that happens, Nero still remains fairly popular with the Roman people to a degree that Otho and Vitellius both that following year uh, both sort of claim that they're reclaiming the throne on behalf of Nero and presenting themselves as sort of his successor. Um, so how is he so popular? But uh, uh, we do have the mention of the Great Fire of Rome, which Nero then uses to begin his construction of the Golden Palace and massive, you know, the aggrandizing uh, 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 palace for himself. And we have the, you know, the, the famously, we have a concept that uh, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. We don't know that he actually sat and played music while Rome was burning. What we do know, though, is that Nero loses the empire essentially because he dithers. I don't know that he was fiddling, uh, but he essentially dithers while rebellions break out. And so over that 18-month period, we have rebellions that engulf the entire empire. There is rebellion. It starts in Gaul with Vindex's revolt. Then suddenly Galba in Spain, there are, you know, troops there in revolt. Uh, later on, we get Vitellius up in Germany. At the same time, you have Vespasian and uh, over in Judea. And so you, you have almost, you know, the entire Roman Empire in, over this 18-month period is brought to some level of revolt or civil war. Um, and Nero, rather than facing any of that, just dithers away and then finds himself abandoned by everyone, the Senate finally steps up and says, okay, enough. And we see with Vitellius what might have happened to Nero. And so Nero, ultimately abandoned by everyone, um, dies by suicide. And in one generation, he manages to take the, the name Nero and turn it from a name that had been worn with pride by the Claudians, that I truly had been worn by, with pride by the Claudians, and it becomes disgraceful, it becomes a name associated with violence and evil and horror, uh, with, with sexual violence, physical violence, just everything awful. Um, and, and the reason is uh, the Claudians had had some success across the Roman Republic. Gaius Claudius Nero basically, I think could, it could be argued, sort of like swung the Second Punic War against Carthage. Uh, with his victory at the Battle of the Metaurus, where he performs a massive force, forced march, surprises Hannibal's brother Hasdrubal Barca, who is bringing an, a, another army over to join Hannibal. And together, their combined armies might finally be able to march on Rome. Uh, and Gaius Claudius Nero goes and wipes out Hasdrubal's army. And that really is the battle that swings that war. Scipio Africanus later wins it at Zama against Hannibal. But, um, but the, the, you know, the names Claudius Nero were names of pride and success. And we now think, of course, of Nero as just the worst. And so Nero is uh, succeeded not by Vindex uh, in Gaul, who starts the revolt, but by Galba, who um, we're going to see. What I, I'm going to try and point out that each of the next three emperors, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, they're sort of almost these, like, uh, shades of other emperors. They're not particularly successful in any respect they they show they reveal almost an aspect of like what is this person's reign like if it's only a very short time and that person truly is a failure like I think all the emperors have failings but if they, they were political failures very quickly as well so we start with Galba and um, <laughs> Galba just does not seem to engender sympathy for either Suetonius or Tacitus uh, and Tacitus presents, I want, to, I want to just briefly mention, Tacitus presents Galba as this like stern disciplinarian who just feels inflexible and unpleasant. Um, Suetonius sort of just, uh, uh, he just briefly touches on the revolt, Galba sort of becoming emperor, not really trying to become emperor, but just becoming emperor, and then realizing that there are problems and not ever quite realizing how serious they are and then he's, you know, murdered in the streets of Rome, essentially, by Otho's conspirators. Uh, he also, <laughs> Suetonius also does the, like, the anti of, the opposite of saying your ancestor was Gaius Claudius Nero, who basically saved Rome, would be to say your ancestor is Mummius, uh, who committed 
what was widely regarded as like a war crime uh, in the sack of Corinth and who famously said that uh, any of the ancient Greek um, sculptures, you know, art that uh, sunk on a voyage back to Rome, well, we could just replace it. And Suetonius is careful to name drop that Mumius is an ancestor of Galba's. Uh, Galba, if, if I had to pick the, the shade of an emperor that Galba reminds me of as a reader, it's Tiberius. Uh, Galba is quite old when he becomes emperor. He seemed to have some degree of competence. He's not particularly successful or great at anything, uh, but he seems to have some level of competence. But by the time he becomes emperor, he's older, he's suffered disappointment. He doesn't, he doesn't really seem particularly interested in being emperor, uh, but he's going to do the job, and he does it poorly. And then um, <laughs> the, the next part with Galba is that there's no clear heir. And so Otho, to a certain degree, thinks maybe he should be the heir. He was a friend of Nero's, an associate of Nero's. Galba should perhaps proclaim him as his heir. Galba selects someone else, and that essentially seals Galba. Otho steps on the stage. And Otho, if Otho is a shade of an emperor, it might, I should say a former Roman figure, it's probably Julius Caesar. Because he is, uh, he's, he's, he's a fop, he's a dandy. Famously, he also, like Caesar, is totally bald, except he wears this amazing toupee and nobody knows it. Uh, but he, like, completely bald. Uh, he, he plucks the hair from his body, like Caesar. Uh, so there's an, an analogous aspect there. There's this idea that Otho essentially tries to become emperor because he's incurred a bunch of debts and he knows that he's going to be in trouble if, if, if there's any authority brought against him. So he just needs to become the supreme authority and take care of business. Uh, so there are shades of Julius Caesar there. Um, Otho is an associate of Nero's. He, um, the, he famously is married to someone, to a woman Nero wants to have an affair with. Uh, and um, <laughs> he expects to be Galba's heir when he is not. He decides to engage in conspiracy and have Galba murdered. He wants to have a, con uh, have a certain date for the conspiracy. He realizes, wait a second, that's the same infantry cohort that was on duty when Nero was abandoned and, you know, it's, it, it took his own life to before the Senate could have him executed. And the same, that same unit was on duty when Caligula was murdered. Well, it would just be really awful if they got a bad reputation, so we're not going to start the rebellion that day. Um, we also have the anecdote about Otho. <laughs> when it's, it's time for him to become emperor, he's being carried in the litter and he decides he's got to run ahead, so he gets out to run ahead and his, you know, his shoes fall off and they go, he, he's humble, let's pick him up and proclaim him emperor. So, uh, Otho, Otho's just, not, not a real success either. He, 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 he's very hasty. He engages in battle with uh, Vitellius' army before Vitellius is even there. And then when he loses, rather than fight another day, uh, he, he dies by suicide the next morning. And he, he engenders this aspect. Tacitus presents him in a similar way that Suetonius does, which is this, this, this man who, realizing that he has lost everything, uh, chooses to sacrifice himself rather than to force his soldiers to die on his behalf again as though that's noble. Mind you, this is a man who three months ago engaged in rebellion and had Galba murdered and Galba's proclaimed heir murdered and still was going to fight Vitellius and, and fought the first battle. So this is a man of great self-sacrifice. Uh, but it is important to note with Suetonius that his father fought under Otho and against Vitellius in that battle. Survived the battle, but fought against Vitellius. So this is possibly where there's some reliability maybe pops up. Enter Vitellius. If, uh, if I'm going to say that Vitellius is a shade of an emperor, it might actually be Nero. Uh, Vitellius just seems to want to be emperor because they're going to make him emperor. And then he's going to live a nice life as emperor. Totally, uh, you know, not realizing that Vespasian's, is, Vespasian's troops realize we have a leader here and we're going to follow this guy to hell. And I don't care what the army in Germany said, we will march on Rome and make Vespasian emperor, you know. Uh, and, and they are hardened troops. They've been fighting the Jewish uh, rebellion. They are hardened troops. And Vespasian is, is, a, is a, a tough, tough leader. So Vitellius just sort of falls into the throne. And we get two dynamite anecdotes about his father. 
The first being that he uh, has a mistress who he uh, takes her spit and mixes it with honey and then uses it as a lotion for his neck and throat. And also that he, <laughs> he's such a sycophant to Claudius that he begs a, a new position to be able to, um, to be the one who takes uh, Empress Messalina's shoes off. And then he holds the right shoe like under between his toga and tunic, like really close to his body. What a strange man. Uh, <laughs> um, so we have this aspect of Vitellius. And Vitellius and Nero both have this idea that when everything goes to hell and, and they're going to be dethroned, um, maybe they could just resign or retire and just kind of pick a province, Egypt somewhere maybe, or just retire and, and call the day. You know, I served as emperor. And there is an an, a historical analog for that. Um, Sulla about at this point we're 140 150 years before Sulla had done something like that he, he marched on Rome became a dictator and then sort of retired right at the end of his life uh, so there there is some historical analog but that wasn't going to happen and Vitellius meets a horrifying and like truly horrifying it's described in graphic detail by Suetonius so I'm not going to describe it here but he meets a horrifying end and likely that might have been the end of Nero um, if the Senate had been able to condemn him. What what happens to Vitellius as the just butchery and, and violence likely is, is something that might have happened to Nero. Uh, we will uh, continue next week with part four, which will be the Flavian dynasty, uh, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. And uh, I do want to uh, identify a couple of texts that I think are, are useful. So Suetonius is a great you know biographer. He's interesting. But if you want to know more about uh, that history of Rome, Nero pops up in the Annals. He's right at the end of the Annals. And the Histories, which is a separate work by Tacitus, the Histories really details uh, that year of four emperors. So Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and then uh, the beginning of the Flavians with Vespasian. And so both are excellent works that really delve into uh, some deeper historical detail, divergent historical detail. Uh, Nero, during his reign, had a number of like famous works of Roman literature that were produced. This was not one of them. Well, it's famous, but it's not particularly good. Seneca was Nero's tutor, and his tragedies are not particularly uh, enjoyable or good or worthwhile. Um, I kind of had to go find this and dig it out. I haven't read it in years. It, it, I, I, I wouldn't recommend these, but... They were written during that reign. Two books that are more uh, interesting. One is uh, Lucan's Pharsalia or Civil War, which is, um, <laughs> it presents Pompey and Cato the Younger as heroes against Caesar during the reign of Nero. Lucan was, uh, like Seneca, was murdered by Nero. Uh, and the, so this epic is unfinished. It is not as enjoyable as the Aeneid by Virgil, but it's, it's a strong work. Um, Cato is presented as a really much more dynamic and interesting than he probably was in real life. I'll just leave it at that. And then famously, we have the Satyricon by Petronius, which, you know, if you want to know what it was like to be at a feast that Nero or uh, Vitellius threw, Trimalcio will, will, will set you straight on that. Uh, this is an outrageous, just, you know, bonkers book uh, that was written during the reign of Nero. And then uh, Jean Racine has a tragedy <laughs> called Britannicus, which is about the son of Claudius, who's murdered by Nero. Uh, Agrippina, the younger, is a character in that tragedy. I have not read it, but I am planning to read uh, Berenice this following week, because Berenice was famously the mistress of Titus, and um, this is the, that is one of Racine's uh, better tragedies, in my opinion. And so when I read part four, I'm also going to read Berenice next week, and I, I would recommend that. So let me know what you thought. Let me know uh, if you found it interesting. Again, probably not enjoyable. But week four will take us in a different direction as we finish up Augustus Long. Thanks, everyone. Bye.